You know how it is when you're looking at a place to live. You have a look around, you think you've asked all the right questions, you sign the contract, and just when you think you're settled in and happy, BAM! Vault of Skeletons. We've all been there, and the London Underground is no exception. The location of today's Tale from the Tube is Farringdon. Farringdon is one of the oldest stations on the entire underground network, dating all the way back to 1863. It was built by the Metropolitan Railway, which is now the Metropolitan Line. Back then, the underground consisted of a single route from Paddington to Farringdon, a tiny fraction of what it is now. But for a short line, there were a lot of obstacles to be overcome. Or undercome, I guess. Farringdon is a very old part of the city, dating all the way back to the Romans, and one that's seen its share of horrors. Nearby is Smithfield, which is now a meat market, but used to be an abattoir. It also saw another kind of slaughter, being a site of execution. Near to that is Charterhouse Square, which was a plague pit at the time of the Black Death. In the 19th century, London was reaching a crisis point. The Industrial Revolution brought people from all over to live and work in the city. But it wasn't really until the second half of the 19th century that there was enough of a railway network to make commuting possible for most of the population. Because the majority of people had to live within walking distance of where they worked, more and more people were crammed into the same amount of space. There was little enough space for the living, but how about the dead? Cremation would be illegal in Britain until 1884. The theory, according to Christian theology, was that on the Day of Judgment we would all be resurrected bodily, and for that to happen, our bodies need to be complete. Cremation was also viewed as something of a pagan ritual. So all bodies had to be buried. Although in practice this was often far from compatible with the notion of dignity in death, or indeed with the idea of a body remaining complete. London's burial grounds were relatively small. For the poor, this meant piling them in as much as possible. Graves might be 20 feet deep, with 17 or 18 bodies sharing the space. Unscrupulous churchmen might not even grant the dead this much. The rather suspect Enon Chapel was investigated after parishioners complained of an extremely strong and extremely foul stench. Inspectors who came in to investigate discovered no fewer than 12,000 corpses wedged into the vault beneath the church. Now, to be fair, the actual number has subsequently been disputed, but that didn't stop the chapel later being turned into a dance hall with the tagline, Dancing on the Dead. So I guess every cloud has a silver lining. Incidentally, Vault of 12,000 Corpses would be an amazing name for a metal band. Farringdon and Clerkenwell were not especially pleasant places to live in the 1860s, due in part to Smithfield, but also the open sewer that was the River Fleet. There were consequently several workhouses in the area, because you've got to put them somewhere. These had their own burial ground on Ray Street, which is a rather short street, part of which crosses the railway. The Victorian solution to the problem of slums tended to be to just knock them down and let the inhabitants figure it out for themselves. That was what happened here in the 1850s. As a consequence of redevelopment, the dead had already had their eternal rest disturbed once. The new road ran through the old graveyard, and so the bodies were disinterred and moved to a vault on the east side of the road. Which was quite unfortunate, because that was where the railway would go a few years later. In 1860, the Metropolitan Railway bought the land they thought they'd need for their line. Now, the way it works when you're building a railway is this. You acquire more land than you actually need, partly so you have space for construction equipment and such like, but also so that you have a bit of wiggle room if you have to divert. As part of their acquisition, the company bought the parish land east of Victoria Street, which, as you will recall, included the Ray Street deceased. In theory, this wasn't much of a problem. The engineers didn't plan to run the line through the vault. It would be close, but it was avoidable. The situation was not ideal, but it was hardly a grave matter. Except then, the River Fleet got involved. The Metropolitan Line may be part of the underground, but I should stress that it wasn't very far underground. The railway was built using a method known as cut and cover, which wasn't really tunnelling at all. A trench would be dug, the track would be laid, and the whole thing would be recovered. So basically that early line was just a bit below street level. 
At Farringdon it was just above the River Fleet and passed perilously close to that putrid channel. On the 18th of June 1862 disaster struck. Under the weight of the workings the roof of the fleet collapsed. The water bubbled up behind the retaining wall, broke through and began to fill the excavation. Soon the workings were ten feet underwater. Although water is perhaps too generous a term for something so filled with domestic waste, animal remains and raw sewage. Nevertheless, the bold and strong-stomached contractors worked fast to make drainage holes. But to no avail. A chain reaction took place. Several hundred yards of brickwork gave way, a gas main ruptured, a mausoleum at St. Peter's burial ground collapsed, causing the first incursion of the deceased. I think it might be worth noting a key belief at this time regarding disease. Germ theory was not widely accepted at this time. It was believed instead that disease was propagated by means of miasma, that is, a foul gas released by decaying matter. As scientific theories go, it was close but no cigar. Actually, it's probably not a good idea to have a cigar around corpse gas anyway. But the point is that for the workers, they no doubt believed that they were being exposed to direct infection as this corporeal matter entered the tunnel. It was during the scramble to fix this crisis that the dead of Ray Street made their presence known. Bulks of timber were laid against the walls of the tunnel. As the ground shifted, one of them broke through the wall, separating the vault from the railway. So now there were enough dead people in the tunnel to make even Bruce Campbell think twice. Eventually the mess was cleared up. Certainly the place was tidy enough for an inspection train to run on the 22nd of August that year. But it wasn't entirely sorted out. Eight days later, a special train was laid on for 600 visitors, those being shareholders and directors of the company, various local and national dignitaries, representatives of the press, and no less a personage than William Gladstone. While the train passed through Clerkenwell, reporters noted something rather unusual piled alongside the track. Stacks of black wooden boxes. The dead, who had been disturbed by the railway, awaiting transportation to a suburban cemetery. Exactly which cemetery, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. Not because I don't want to, I genuinely don't know, it doesn't say in any of these books. Sorry about that. Death and the underground have a long association, whether that's urban legends about plague pits or ghosts haunting the stations. But sometimes things are a little more on the nose, shall we say. Well, I hope you enjoyed this grisly tale from the tube. If so, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi, on Patreon, and here on YouTube for your generous support. You are the black box to my strewn bones. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.